Okay, I'm going to speak about nuclear deformations across the nuclear chart and, and specifically for that talk, I selected, let's say, favorite model, which I'm working with. This is covariant density functional theory. And this outline of the talk, let's say, I hope that I will cover most of those topics, but if not, let's say, we can, we can discuss issues later. Uh, so basically, first, uh, there's no talk. <laughs> yeah. so it worked, it worked. So it's the laser, uh, the laser works. The laser works. Yes, yes. Oh, so also this works. Ah, okay, okay, now it works, yeah, thank you. Okay, so basically, first is motivation and theoretical framework. And if you start with this many body nuclear problem, uh, there is no simple and straightforward way let's say, to solve this problem because it's too complicated. Let's say. Now you start to make approximations and for example you can do the spherical shell model or the initial type of calculations uh, but if you want to cover full nuclear landscape the only way to do is the density functional theory. It's only feasible approach to that but then even then you have two choices to make, which equation you are using, Schrodinger equation or Dirac equation, let's say, and this leads to two types of the models. So non-relativistic Schrodinger equation gives us a density functional series based on the skirm and Romney forces. And if you start from relativistic Dirac equation, you are dealing with covariant density functional theory. But that is not only the approximation or choice you need to make, you need to select a range of interaction. Let's say, uh, to make life easy, you can select contact interaction, zero range. And then you are dealing with either strong density functional theory or with point coupling models and covariant density functional. And basically that means that there is no methods. If you select more complicated way, then you deal in non-relativistic DFT with Gogne forces, or in relativistic approach, you deal with meson exchange models and covariant density functional theory. But this is not end of the story because basically what we do, we introduce effective density independence, which as you will see later, is motivated by more uh, sophisticated model and which serves the goal of incorporating of many body correlations like three body forces in effective way. And then let's say you can do this effective density is an in explicit way, like two functionals, which I'm frequently using, like DDMU2 and DDPC1, or in non-linear ways through the powers of the mesons, and then you deal with NL1 and NL3 star functionals in covariant density functional theory. But a similar kind of challenge exists also in the uh, non-relativistic density functional theories. There are different prescriptions for density dependence, and some models even try to avoid, let's say, this density dependent if you go beyond the field. Let's say. Let's say, so there is a lot of, let's say, approximations. And because of this kind of approximations, you really deal with some kind of theoretical uncertainties. Let's say, and uh, let's say a few words about covariant density functional theory. Uh, in covariant density functional theory, the nucleus is described as a system of nucleons which interact via the exchange of effective mesons. So in simple standards, you have sigma omega rho mesons with specific quantum numbers, and they take care, let's say sigma meson for long range attraction, omega meson for short range repulsion, and imbalance between protons and neutrons is taken care by the rho meson. Definitely you can complicate model, adding additional mesons or additional coverings, but uh, reality is that, let's say, you cannot define realistically in a reliable way the parameters. Now, let's say you can also write the total energy in terms of fermionic and mesonic densities uh, and their gradients. Uh, and next step, let's say you use variational principle to obtain the Hamiltonian. And then life is getting similar to what we do in non-relativistic uh, series. You solve Hamiltonian type equation and you get agent functions and agent values. However, there is some uh, complication as compared with non-relativistic uh, series in terms that we have two types of the particles. We have fermions for which we are using direct 
equation, let's say, which is written here. And it is necessary to remember that when you deal with Dirac equation, your wave function contains large and small components. And this complicates the situation because let's say a small components has opposite particles compared to large component, then your basis state is twice as compared to non-relativistic uh, theory. So computationally more difficult. Then you have a claim gardon equation, which for example, illustrated here for sigma meson, and you see that non-linearities which are coming through the sigma, uh, quart, uh, sorry, uh, square and cubic terms for the sigma. And then you have space-like, uh, uh, sorry, time-like component of the omega meson. And this is simple standards. A claim gardon equation does not cost you so much. The largest part of the cost is coming from the solution of the fermion equation. But basically, when you solve meson equations, they create a new field in which fermions are moving. So now, let's say if you look on the general structure model, you have, let's say, large scalar attractive potential and large vector repulsive potential. Uh, look, look, this is uh, on the level of 400 energy per nuclear of opposite science, let's say. But the final result, which is some of those two, is something like 50 MeV per nucleon, and it is typical nucleonic potential which we are dealing with nuclear structure. The next step is very simple. Let's say, look, you uh, try to find, let's say, wave functions, agent values, let's say, like illustrated here in case of oxygen 16. Let's say you have large shell gap of two and eight, uh, let's say, uh, but then also you can calculate single particle densities and total densities, like illustrated here for the, uh, let's say, chain of uh, oxygen isotopes. You see, you start from oxygen 16, then you add few extra neutrons, let's say, and then you go to 22 and 26 oxygen, and you see those light systems, the density distributions change very drastically because they depend on the nodal structure of the occupied single particle states. So the, uh, the room I found as a vector it doesn't show up here. Or... Uh, yeah, look, I simplify equation because if I would put set of equations, so they are less important. Uh, yeah, it's let's say here what I'm trying to give is schematic understanding of the situation. It's completely mm -hmm. valid for any quasi system. Let's say because the room does not play so much role in uh, the symmetric system. Let's say, but when you go to neutron rich nuclear, room becomes very important. But th this cancellation, I mean, is, is you're canceling too big a number to get a small number. But is, is this also the same uh, same issue in the, I mean, also shows up in the non-relativistic? No, in non-relativistic is different. Let's say because they basically have <laughs> multipliers of 50 mU times nucleons, let's say, for kinetic energy, for potential energy, let's say. In our case, let's say, look, if you look on the total, uh, Vector of scalar potential. Those are thousands, potential of thousands of emitters. And the cancellation is, uh, let's say, indeed uh, leading to this 50 mV per nuclear, but it has also some important consequences because of this, let's say, big numbers, your parameters for sigma and omega mesons are very narrowly defined as a parameter space mm -hmm. because you cannot, let's say, play so much with the next. But maybe there's an indirect connection because the effective mass is small in the non-relativistic theory. And uh, in the Dirac equation from the scalar potential, there's, a, there's a, an effective mass. Uh, is that correct? Uh, look, basically, if you deal with, uh, okay, if you look on density functional series, non-relativistic type, let's say, in Gogni, it's around 0 0.7, let's say. Okay. Yeah, in Skirm, it's from 0 0.6 up to 1.0, let's say. I mean, effective mass, let's say. In the non -rel in relativistic series, it's because there are several definitions of the effective mass. We need to deal with not with Dirac mass, which is related to the scalar vector fields, mm -hmm. but with, uh, uh, let's say, derivative of the energies, let's say, which is related to Lorentz mass. And Lorentz mass is around 0 0.65, so this is not far away from the Gogni okay. density functions. Yeah, okay. One so, question. Yeah. So if the light nuclear has constant structure, will the density function be bricked? I mean, the parameters need to be changed. You mean, let's say, those nuclei? Yeah. In the ground state, they don't have a cluster structure. 
But say you need to make excitations. For example, look beryllium eight. Let's say mm -hmm. ground state is more or less like normal deformed nuclei. But if you go to excited states, you create uh, two alpha particles. Let's say. And this is a super deformed rotation of that which is experimental, experimental moments. So for don't for carbon and the oxygen in the ground state, they, they don't have. Look, uh, I need to look specifically in those cases. Let's oh. say because sometimes there is some. Sometimes. Fingerprints of clusterization. You need to look on the densities, let's say. <coughs> and for example, if you go to neon uh, 20, it can be described as oxygen 16 plus alpha particles. And then you see that in the density, but this leads to optical. Sure, so I guess, um, uh, um, follow the question. So, uh, so the, the question does the mean field approach capture these correlations? Between you know, like a, you know, a few particles in the in, if how well it captures. Look, those. basically, is the uh, situation is a following. So if you look on the light nuclei, yeah. there is a bunch of the cluster models which start from different assumptions, mm -hmm. and those models let's say emphasize one or another aspect of the clusterization, mm -hmm. and from the beginning, let's say they can be let's say wrong, let's say. Right. and uh, we look together with Japanese guys with Itagaki. Uh, let's say in uh, 2019, a cluster of calcium 14, let's say, which appears, let's say, uh, in, uh, in his model, which is cluster type model, and my model, there is a lot of similarities. Let's say. That is not the same, but look, if you start from cluster model and you start to perform symmetrization of the wave function, let's say you mix many things. Sure, sure. But the cluster naturally emerges from this calculation. Yeah. I can show you, let's say, a lot of nice cluster structures, let's say, if you, let's say. especially if you go to particle for excitation or rotational structures, you see a lot of interesting things. So basically, this model can capture, let's say, some aspects of clusterization, but again, let's say, you need to go, yeah, you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, I mean, it's, it's completely different. I mean, I know, I know that's not a point you wanted to make, but for, you should see in the 26, what is the reply? I mean, you got the uh, reply. reply is oxygen 24, but look, yeah, um, but it's like, missed, let's say, in a, almost all the models. Which yeah, don't no, no, it's, it was just out of curiosity. Yeah. You predict, you have predicted the, you know, what's the reply for this? Uh, uh, yeah, we are overshooting, let's say, by two meters. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say, in this case, I mean, so it's, <laughs> it's 26. Yeah. So, but look, it's a general problem here, yeah. I would say, and uh, some people will try to introduce three body forces or something like that, let's say, but uh, uh, that creates, okay, you have extra feeding parameters. Let's say. <coughs> anyway, let's say, so can I continue with the yeah, yeah. questions? Okay, let's say, you can ask, let's say, why relativistic approach? Here are several, uh, let's say, questions, let's say, first is, Look, definitely nucleons are not moving at relativistic velocities in seconds. This is understood from the beginning, but what is important is spin orbit interaction. Because let's say, look, if you do skirm, you need to parameterize skirm, uh, let's say, spin orbit interaction. The same story with Bogni DMT. If you do relativistic, let's say, uh, there is no need to do that, and we are getting the spin orbit interaction in a reasonable way. A good way, let's say, compared with experimental data. Let's say I'm not going into details. What is also important, let's say, it has practical applications for many phenomena like rotation, like uh, approaches beyond mean field. Let's say that we are getting uh, time old mean fields via Lorentz covariance. And what we see is very weak de dependence on the uh, parameterization. And let's say we also uh, alone, let's say, by studying rotating nuclei, which are sensitively dependent on these time mode mean fields, that these time mode mean fields are well defined in the covariant density functional theory. And here the situation is much more favorable as compared with non relativistic DFTs. The reason is very simple in non relativistic DFTs, there are three prescriptions how to define time mode mean fields. And sometimes they give uh, different results. So now let's say how the structure of the model is working. Uh, look, basically what we have, let's say we have uh, our Lagrangian and the interaction as illustrated in those diagrams as defined by the coupling constant. 
let's say you want to incorporate the effect of let's say three body four body forces in a phenomenological way so you'd make those coupling constants let's say density dependent and this is illustrated here for different for sigma omega and rho measurements let's say or let's say you can go let's say way how it is done in non-relativistic series let's say you can collapse interaction range from finite to zero so basically you remove let's say exchange term and you can simply introduce let's say this kind of variance and then you get point coupling point omega each of them has own pluses and minuses now in practical application we are using relativistic heritage of valuable framework which is shown here and if there is a pairing in the system we are using separable version of the finite range big book apart of the Gordon B1 as forced in particle particle channel now uh, some of the global results which I will discuss are available either in publication but you can go also to mass explore at every and basically here there is a collection of all mass tables skirm relativistic uh, and non-relativistic like it's like Gorgian let's say. So you can pick up and say which you want, which you like it. <clears throat> and uh, basically, let's say when I analyze, let's say theoretical uncertainties, I will come to that a bit later. I am using three functionals like this: NO3 star, DDME2, DDPC1, and DDME delta, which have a different, let's say, structure. Uh, and that is simply to understand, let's say, what are the uh, consequences of the initial approximations, like range of interaction and density dependence. For example, NO3 is nonlinear uh, density dependent, PC means coin coupling, let's say, and uh, meson exchange, ME means meson exchange, so there is different range of interaction. Now, let's start from a simple exercise. You can ask, and this has not come, let's say, to the discussion so far. Uh, what defines the deformation? Why some nuclei are spherical and other nuclei are deformed, let's say, and what is driving this kind of changes? And here we see a clear connection to underlying single particle structure. Now, let's start first, let's say, from the definition of the parameters, like we do in the calculations. In the calculations, we calculate respective moments using this multiple moment definition. So you can define is a quadrupole, octopole, let's say hexadecupole uh, deformation, let's say using, let's say those uh, parameters for R zero radius. And then let's say you have, uh, let's say if you restrict yourself to the uh, reflection symmetric shapes, you have three choices for the shapes. Let's say classical is spherical shape, this deformation is zero. If you go to the proid shape, you get, let's say, this elongated uh, structures, uh, beta 2 deformation is positive. In oblate, let's say, you squeeze, let's say, the nucleus, let's say, along the axis of symmetry, and you get oblate shapes, let's say. In addition, in some regions, and this is, let's say, very interesting for this community, we are dealing with so-called axial symmetrical optical shapes. And basically that means that let's say uh, the shape is illustrated here. It's taken from this uh, publication by Peter Butler. And you see this is different as compared to those ones. Now, but, yeah. Uh, can, can you have a beta three that is large, but beta two almost zero? Yes, we can. Okay. So look, we have all freedom, let's say, but solution dictates the situation. Uh, now, let's say this is so-called Nielsen diagram, which are frequently appear in the density functional theory. Basically, what we do here, we plot single particle energies as a function of the deformation. And here the game is done, on, let's say, using slightly different definition of the deformation. This is a Nielsen potential. Let's say. This is basically what I did more than 20 years ago, let's say. And I simply use it for illustrative purposes, let's say, to give you idea what is happening now look let's see that we have this is large let's say uh, shell gap at pro, at particle number 50. the total energy can be written in the following way this is a liquid drop shell correction energy and pairing energy those two are basically favoring spherical shape so you can see that let's say from this uh, plot for the plutonium uh, 242 let's say this is a liquid drop energy you see how it behaves if you go to lighter system, it will be more 
would say more narrow words. <clears throat> uh, here, large Coulomb interaction plays again. So, so now, if you look on the total energy, it's fluctuating with respect to this liquid drop. And the reason is very simple because it reflects the quantum part of the problem. Let's say if you have, uh, sorry, if you have very low density of the single particle states, then the shell correction energy will be negative. Let's say, and uh, let's say if the density is very large, shell correction energy is positive. So basically to have a stable system, you would like to have a negative shell correction energy. And for example, here in plutonium, you have uh, this situation at this minimum, you see the difference between liquid drop and total energy is negative, let's say. And so you get a normal deformed minima and let's say going further in deformation, you are getting super deformed minima, which is absorbed in expired. So basically many things are dictated by the density of the single particle states and again, the basic rule is very simple. You try to avoid large single particle densities. Now, what will happen if you change the particle number? For example, look on the particle number 50. You have one large shell gap at spherical shape, but if you go to deformed shape, let's say you get still shell gap. Let's say there is low density because you remove 2j plus 1 degeneracy of the single particle state and replace it with a double degeneracy of the single particle states. But, and that basically tells that, for example, in new previous proton number, sorry, this number 50, you will have spherical minimum, which is ground state, but you will have also excited minimum, which is, let's say, deformed state. Now, if you change a particle number, okay, this is ground state. If you go to, for example, 60, you see there is bunching of the single particle states. Each of the single particle states has two J plus one degeneracy. So, that's it. so basically you get a lower density of the single particle states in this region, then at spherical shape. As a consequence, let's say when it is increase of particle number, you go to the proid shape. And next step, let's say if you go up, let's say in the particle number, let's say you are running in the region where at Oblate shapes, there is low density of the single particle states. And as a consequence, you get the oblate shapes here. And this simple rule that when you go from one closed shell to another closed shell and you start from spherical shell, from spherical shapes, go to the prolate and then end up in oblate is valid in many cases. It's, it's depends on the balance of proton and neutron contribution, but you will see this kind of situation uh, also in. Uh, so let's say relativ relativistic density function calculations. Now you can ask, let's say, how to create this mean field potential. Well, basically, so, you, uh, yeah. So how do I see? Uh, you mean this get a, a low single particle states uh, in that uh, oblate region? I mean, how do I see? Look, this is density. Uh -huh. you, you see those states are 2j plus 1 degenerated, let's say. So for example, H I 11 curve, you have here 12 states sitting, let's say. But then let's say when you uh, change the deformation, you separate states because of this Y two zero interaction, let's say, and uh, uh, let's say they are characterized now by the projection of angular momentum on the axis of symmetry. And each of those states only twice the generator. So you see here, the density of the single particle state is much larger than here, for example. And this drives the system to the oblate shape. Uh, so, so what happens to the particle? It just uh, occupies some... You have the number of uh, nucleons still fixed, right? So you occupy... can see, let's say, in the self-consistent calculation, but basically these rules are working both in, let's say, microscopic plus microscopic model or density functional theory. Let's say DFT is more complicated, but look, since I spent 90s in this Nelson model, let's say I really know, let's say this kind of simplified game. You start understanding not from the total energy or total deformation, but you look also on the underlying single particle strategy. And it helps a lot in many situations. More questions? Okay, let's go. Let's say, so basically, look, you can ask, let's say, how you can uh, create this kind of single particle potential, let's say, and in reality, uh, you can. Uh, start from the general Hamiltonian, which includes, let's say, two body interactions, but then reduce the Hamiltonian 
to the following form, which contains the sum of the single particle Hamiltonians and some residual interaction. If you assume that the residual interaction is small, let's say, then you are dealing with independent particle motion, single particle Hamiltonians, and defined by the Schrodinger equation, you need simply to select potential. And for the modified harmonic oscillator potential, you basically select, let's say, some additional terms. Okay, this is classical harmonic oscillator potential. You add term which proportional to deformation, then you add term, let's say, which moves your potential from harmonic oscillator to more like square well potential, and then you add spin orbit interaction. And in this way, let's say, you create a single part of harmonic. Doesn't matter what you do, let's say you play with density functional theory or this spherical shell model. You're basically running in this kind of picture. Now, the question is the following, let's say, uh, how accurately we can describe or predict the single particle energies, because this will be one of the main sources of theoretical uncertainties. If you play with spherical shell model, let's say, what you can do, you can accurately fit empirical interaction to experimental data and get very good description of the excited spectra in nuclei not far away from the double closed shell. But again, let's say this is limited to this vicinity. And as we recently started, studied in the case of the charge radia, introduction of the core leads to the neglection of the polarization effects. And for many physical observables, those polarization effects are important. Now, if you go to the density functional theory, we are not that good in terms of the accuracy of the description of the states. And this is, let's say, what we do here, we take four nuclei, which are closed shell nuclei, like 56 nuclei, 110, 132, 10, 2, 11. And we run very simple spherical model, or sorry, spherical relativistic mean field calculations with 10 functionals, and we define the spread of the single particle energies. And uh, let's say those are largest and smallest energies which you obtain. And then you see, let's say, how large are uncertainties in the definition of absolute single particle energies. Let's say, and even let's say, if you select, let's say, the four best functions, which are globally tested, let's say, analyzed, let's say, you still have, in many cases, one MED uncertainty in the position of the single particle energies. Doesn't matter what you do, let's say you can replace this relativistic model with Gogni or sperm density function. I'm completely sure that we will run at the same time. Uh, it's a problem. And the reason is very simple because we never use simple particle energies in the Philip protocols of the density functions. Well, what's the meaning of the, what is uh, shaded? And yeah. the shaded look, this is, let's say, 10. Covariant energy density functions. Mm -hmm. And this is only for the best. Let's say. I see. Okay. So even let's say for the best, let's say gives you quite large uncertainty. At least there's a maximum difference among them. Yeah. <clears throat> and we cannot get rid out of this problem. It's not at this stage of the development, development of the density functional theory. And I'm even not speaking about the differences between non relativistic and relativistic. These are, they, these are the, for the double magic. Yeah, nuclei, but uh, uh, those those orbits are many of them uh, are, are those all occupied or I occupied? Uh, yeah, or those are occupied too because it's all of these are all, all occupied. Okay. Now, look for the form systems. Let's say the same Nielsen diagrams, and here I am. Look, we did together with Yats and Bachevsky the study. Let's say, and here we play with Skirm. Gogni and relativistic density functional theories. Again, look on spherical shape, which corresponds to beta two deformation zero. There you see quite somewhat large, let's say, shell gaps at spherical shape. But look, in those nuclear spherical shapes are not very really critical because really what you see is deformation. And if you look on the deformation, uh, there are some differences, let's say, between the functions. Not only in the location of this smaller deformed shell gaps, but also in terms of the single particle states which are in the vicinity of uh, those uh, cars. If you compare with experiments, situation is not oh, critical. Oh, I see difference between the left and, um, <laughs> left and right. This is skirm, this is Gourmet density function. Okay. Uh, look, you have, for example, here 152, here 148. Mm -hmm. 150, uh, 
two is not here because of the difference in the relative energies of two gene and half and one ion. So you see, everything depends on those single particle energies of spherical shape, the problems propagate also to the different shapes. And so this also in the form, they are already different then. Yeah, the difference becomes smaller, let's say, because when you do that, let's say you include part of this so-called particle vibration coupling in the mean field, let's say, but this is another story. But from what we see, let's say different functions give you some differences in the single particle energies. Now, Let's look on the global view. And here we are coming to the discussion of the theoretical uncertainties. I really hate the word theoretical errors. And the reason is very simple. Let's say if you look carefully, let's say which kind of uh, uncertainties you can have. Let's say one is coming so-called statistical uncertainties, which are coming from the selection of the fitting protocol. Within a given fitting protocol, you can define them quite accurately because there is real statistical methods how to do that. However, if you go to systematic uncertainties, they are related to the basic assumptions which you make in the creation of the models. So that is physics assumptions. And here, let's say you have uncontrollable, let's say, uh, biases, let's say. And as a consequence, I really prefer to speak about systematic uncertainties. And uh, we define them simply as a spread of the predictions for a given physical absorber. For, for example, let's say if you take a deformation, this would be maximum and the minimum value of the deformation in given nucleus calculated with set of the functions. Now let's look what it gives us. Uh, so it, when you do fade, uh, do you fade the most fade double magic? Or you, what, what, what is the, what, what data you fit? Uh, we usually fit spherical nuclei, okay. but I will, Mention, let's say, what we did recently, let's say, which substantially improves the description of the situation. Now, let's look on the binding energy spreads. Okay, here we are using four functions NO3 star, DDME2, DDPC1, and DDME double. And what is shown here is energy spread and energy in binding energies. And you see, let's say, no nuclei are shown by this, let's say, black solid line. Let's say, and within this range, let's say our typical uncertainties are within, let's say, two to occasionally five, six MeV. So that is not bad, let's say, because let's say if you look on this aspect of the problem in a little different way, uh, because we are calculating those differences on large total binding energy. So instead of looking on absolute values, let's look on the relative values. Uh, relative values. That is basically this quantity, but in each nucleus we define it by, divided by total binding energy and multiplied by 100% to get the percentage. Let's just say. And then you see that, okay, in most of the middle mass and normal deformed nuclei, look, we are on the level of 0.2% of the uncertainty in the binding energy, which is quite good, let's say. And reality is, let's say, if you go to systems like Coulomb systems, let's say, where you can compare DFT solution with the Venetia solutions for the same interaction. Uh, they learn that if you do DFT, their binding energies are within 0.3% of the Venetia solution for a given interaction. So, so base, and the problem is related to definition of the exchange term on the DFT, let's say. So basically, we are even doing better, let's say, in those nuclei than uh, condensed matter is speed. So let's say the only problem emerges somewhat in lighter systems, and it's understandable because beyond mean field effects uh, on the relative scale are getting much bigger here as compared to heavy systems. Now, okay, binding energies, but let, now let's look on the deformation, which is more interesting, let's say. And uh, this is picture, colors are probably better on the screen. Let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but basically what I'm using the following definition, let's say spherical shape is defined by gray color. And you see, we have pronounced bands of the nuclei which corresponds to the neutron shell closures, but for protons, let's say, even let's say if you look on 80 to 50, it is not that pronounced. The fact that the proton shell closures on the deformations of the systems is less pronounced than neutron shell closures. 
And again, let's say you see this kind of trend, which I mentioned, for example, you start from here, uh, this is a spherical shape, you go in that direction of increase the neutron number, you're getting more and more prolate, pro prolate, and then you go down, and here, before reaching spherical shape, you have a region of the oblate shapes. Let's say, and finally, you reach next shell closure, where you have a spherical shape. But you see, here, picture is more complicated as compared with what I discussed so, because you have impact or interaction of protons and neutrons. Yeah. Okay, you, 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 make some, you said something about, so if I look, if I, uh, in the uh, neutron shell closure, they all spherical, right? If I look the vertical line, yeah. right? but in, along the proton line, that's very narrow. They're also, the deformation is, is smaller, but there's sometimes actually still deformed. So what's the reason between the proton and the neutron? Um, it did not look on that yet. Is a feature of the model or is this also seen in the data in general? Uh, is this is seen in the data also. We, we, we don't disagree so much in general terms, let's say, mm -hmm. with data, but uh, definitely what we see is better localization of the, let's say, mm -hmm. larger impact of the neutron shell closure, see, which propagates to larger sort of now, if you look, let's say, on hexadecoupled deformation, remember what Peter was showing this kind of oscillating behavior. In some nuclei, we see this, like here it's increasing, then it is decreasing, let's say, but this is not always a case, especially in very systems. Uh, now, this, uh, you also, this is only for proton beta too. Is, uh, I mean, I will come, please wait, two more slides and we will see neutrons. Uh, okay, now let's look on the case which of interest for this community, <coughs> actinides, uranium isotopes. Uh, look, we can extract experimental predatory formation in case of rotational systems with high precision, let's say using either Coulomb excitations and lifetime measurements, which is direct measurement, let's say, which is shown here by solid surface, or you can use this Grodzins relation which relates uh, zero to two plus energy difference uh, uh, to the deformation, which is also quite accurate. And as you can see in uraniums using two functions, we are pretty close, let's say. And the same story basically for most of those, let's say, uh, actinides. Let's say. So actinides, and you see what is also interesting. Look, the change of the deformation here in actinides is relatively modest. If you go, for example, in rear S region, let's say the change is still be large. So here it's very robust. Let's say. Now, quadrupole deformation spread, and this is, let's say, where those underlying single particle uncertainty starts to play a role. What we define here is spreading the difference between uh, delta beta two, let's say. So this is basically difference between largest and smallest better to have obtained in a given request using set of the functions. And as you can see, for example, in the middle of rear S region, everything is, let's say, either uh, gray or slightly yellowish, let's say, which is basically close to zero, which is better seen here. But when you look on transition from spherical shape to deformed shapes, you see there is a problem, let's say, there is uh, different, large differences. And if you look, let's say, this is around 0 0.2, sometimes 0 0.3. You can ask, let's say, from where they are coming. This is coming from the fact that transition from spherical shape to deformed shape takes place at different particle numbers and different functions. Mm -hmm. Or alternatively, if you go to that region, let's say there is a uh, prolate oblate shape coexistence, and again, it takes place at different particle numbers. And this immediately is seen in this uh, quadruple deformation spread. So, and again, let's say if you look carefully, it's related to uncertainties in the single particle. Look, liquid drop, let's say, more or less stable, it does not play so much role. Pairing is secondary, everything is related to quantum shell correction effects, which depends on the underlying single particle. Structure. So I have a question. I just got asked. Can you go back? Uh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so, so to estimate the beta two, you have this uh, direct method and indirect method. Can you explain what what is the look? Direct method? method is basically let's say look, it's like you relate beta two to proportion to two to zero. Okay. You can measure it from 
the twos and then you convert it, let's say, into the Q to zeros, let's say, using a rigid rotor model approximation. Again, approximation, let's say, is a key facilitating, which agrees with experimental data. Now, uh, let's say this is indirect method, which is basically as the following. It takes energy difference between two plus to zero plus within the rotational band, and then it correlates to better two. And there are, let's say, systematic studies based on the set of experimental data, which provide quite nice correlation between those two. Oh, how the lifetime measurement is related to the beta two? Lifetime. Uh, Look, you will get what is this one. This so is the lifetime and the, the P2, they're the, not the same information, but they have a simple relation. They are connected. Yeah. Yes. Now, this is, this is all done on the assumption of axial symmetry, yes? Yeah, exactly. But look, assumption of axial symmetry, you can verify, let's say, by looking for delta K mixing, let's say, in the ground states of, uh, let's say, nuclear in this region. And uh, in rear as such and in actinides, axial symmetry is well justified, that is both from theory and experimental points of view. If you go to lighter systems, you're getting less. Because the axiality starts to play a role, let's say you can get it more. But for those structures which show regular rotation of bands, where you can look on this before, this ratio of the four to two, to two to zero transitions, which is 3.3. .3. If you get, let's say, then you can safely use this process of acceleration. Now, okay, this is, let's say, what we I already discussed, let's say. You can ask, let's say, from where those kind of small differences or large differences are coming, let's say. And this is uh, potential energy curves as obtained for the mercury isotopes for five functions. And as you can see, in some cases, there are large similarities, let's say, but if you go, for example, to that system, uh, let's say both relative energies of different minima are different. The shape of the curves is different, let's say, and that also will show up, let's say, later on if you do the Now, Exodocobal deformation spread is shown. Here it's less irregular. Uh, again, theoretical uncertainties are most pronounced for transitional nuclei or for the point of transition from one shape to another shape, let's say, in quadrupole deformation. Now, this is isovector, let's say, which is probably what you were asking, the difference between proton and neutron deformations, let's say, which Vitek showed, by the way, on Monday in Sturm calculations. In CDFT, neutron deformation is larger than proton one in two thirds of nuclei. In the rest of deformed nuclei, the situation is opposite. In Sturm DFT, let's say this is a bit of results, neutron deformation is smaller than proton one in majority of nuclei. You see, we have a vice versa correlation, but if you look on the scale of those deformation differences, they are not that like the 10-20% of the total deformation. Less, let's say. Look, for example, if you go to the middle here, it's 0 0.025. Deformation here is around 0 0.35. Let's say this is 6-7%, let's say, in most case scenario. In many cases, it's much smaller. So what we also found, let's say, that isovector deformation is typically small and covariant density functional. And from here, Mick Mark Moore, which assumes the same deformation for protons and neutrons, is better justified in CDFT than in Skirm DFT calculations. Now, let's say those results were obtained seven to eight years ago, let's say, using old functionals, let's say. And we are now working on uh, And the problem was that at that time, we can fit only functionals to the spherical nuclei. So this creates some biases in binding energies, let's say. And uh, recently we were working on improvement of this. Let's say basically we uh, created a set of functions of different energies so using new approach, which we call anchor-based approach. Let's say basically what we do, we still fit spherical nuclei, but we correct, let's say, binding energies and some other information for the information which we extract from the form plus. 
And as you can see, for example, this is two new functionals, let's say, the RMS deviation for the ground uh, state uh, binding energies are going down from 2.6 MeV down to 1.7 MeV. So drastical improvement, let's say, uh, and uh, now we are on the same level or sometimes better than this unitary function, skewn density functions. Uh, feeding protocol in this anchor based method is much simpler. Let's say cheaper, you might recall this so video, get more results. But this is how it looks, let's say, if you look on the difference between uh, experimental and theoretical binding energies. I forget, let's say, to put energy here. So, uh, and we verify this method by populations in deformed nucleates. Verification took more time, let's say, than creation of the function. So, but this is, let's say, working on the progress, but even with that, let's say, I believe that there will be still theoretical uncertainties in the deformations, because, let's say, we don't fit single particle energies, and there is no way to fit them. Now, let's look on the basic features which are related to the charge density distribution, because it gives you some information that follows from this presentation on Tuesday, let's say. And let's see where we stay here. Now let's take this, okay, this is what we are using in the definition. We calculate point proton charge radius, let's say correct it for form factor, we get charge radius, we then take a difference of the squares of those charge radius between reference nucleus, which is usually a two way let 126 for neutron number and some arbitrary value. And this is experimental data. You see some scattering, let's say, between odd and even nuclei. Uh, unit def one calculations, which is comm functional, gives you straight line. In our, this is, let's say, another non relativistic function, which was uh, adjusted by Nakada, let's say, using slightly somewhat different philosophy. It's somewhat better, but if we are using our DDME2 and we are using, let's say, ground state, sorry, uh, states which corresponds to the ground state in experimental data, we are getting, let's say, both nice, let's say, slope and change of the slope, which is called the kin, differential charge relay. And we are both also getting, let's say, this whole different stacking in charge relay. So you can ask, let's say, why is this big difference between non-relativistic and relativistic functionals? And it turns out that this is related to occupation of two states which are related, which are located above 126 newton shell closure. In relativistic models, you occupy one I11 half subshell in non-relativistic, typically a 2G9 reference. And this creates this huge difference because occupation of this Neutron subshell drives the proton densities on microscopic level, and all the states <coughs> which are occupied in proton subsystems are affected by this addition of the neutron. So, well, this process is better reproducing a relativistic framework. Uh, now, so what's the origin of the kink? Uh, look, it's occupation of different mm -hmm. single particle states. Look, you have your single particle state 126. Here you have, let's say, uh, two states, one I11 cuff and two G9 cuff. They have different nodal structure of the wave function. There you have, uh, let's say, one node, uh, sorry, this is nodeless and this is uh, two nodes, let's say. And they are having different impact on the proton densities on each single particle occupied states. And this is order in relativistic framework in non-relativistic, you have inversed, and as a consequence, you don't get a kink. So, so this relates the interaction of the, this actual neutron wave function with the charge pro, pro, Proton neutron interaction, yes, because it affects all the... So sort of like a polarization effect, right? Yes. Or, or it, yeah. And basically this tells you that, okay, you cannot apply, for example, spherical short model to the description of charge radii, although it gives you better single particle spectra, and the reason is very simple. It will give, let's say, the same straight line. Let's say because it will be polarization. Now, uh, let's look on the mercury isotopes. There was a nice result, let's say. We, yeah. I have a question. Um, do you see the same thing for other observables? Like on this 
the new loop that we're going to observe a lot for the same isotopes. What, what, what do you mean by isotope? Like, yeah, you look at the but do you see the same kind of difference that you can relate? Your uh, no, no, look, but, for, let's say, to energy or whatever. Basically, let's say, look in ground, in even in systems, you have zero plastic structure is unknown, let's say, in a sense. Uh, it's model dependent. You don't have a strict, let's say, certain experimental methods to define the mixture of the states in this ground state. So let's forget about even in the nucleus. In odd nucleus, we require that we are obtaining the same single particle state in the calculations, like in the experiment. If you do that, let's say, you get, let's say, uh, uh, let's say this four even study. But if you don't do that, you will get the station. You can discuss this a bit more. Right? There is a lot of interesting cases. But my question was more, for example, if you look at the binding energy. Look, you binding see? energy is, let's say, well, okay, within 0.2 percent, let's say. Total binding. I really don't concern so much about that. And look, charge radium measure not that much binding energy. It's, it's more like special distribution of the charge. Okay, now again, let's say to the picture which I showed before, where we see quite large differences in the potential energies for some isotopes. And what is interesting is this transition you see in light. Sorry, in nuclei in the vicinity of 126 shell closure, you have more like, let's say, harmonic oscillator potential. However, if you go to the neutron numbers around 100, 106, you see coexistent minima, let's say, and potential energy surfaces flat, indicating potential, let's say, changes in the deformation. Now, if you go to experimental data for charge radiation, you see this is experiment. It follows more or less straight line with some good even study. Let's say between even, even, and even. But then around neutron number 100 and 106, let's say you get this big zigzag. Let's say. This is biggest zigzag, let's say, charge, differential charge, radiant and four nuclear charge. You can ask what is the reason? And the reason is the following. Let's say here you are following one minima, but this quad nuclear corresponds to different minima. Let's say there's different deformation. And if you take this into account, if you don't concern about relative images, if you look on the deformation, then you can explain this or the sorry, this staggering, let's say, as emerging from the deformation changes in even even and odd Let's say this is in one minima, this is in another, let's say. So you go from even even to odd, let's say you go to this deformation. Now you add or remove one neutron, you go to even even. You go back, let's say, to the original deformation and so on, let's say. This is interplay between weak oblate deformation for the no, weak prolate deformation. No, vice versa, weak oblate deformation and weak prolate deformation. So you can explain those, let's say. Now, Malibdenium, which is closer to this region. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Is, uh, is, uh, <coughs> Uh, so this odd even st staggering means when you are uh, when you have um, it's very larger charge radius. Uh, that means like the three three uh, snowflakes or whatever this this on top. Those are have large prolate deformation or of uh, okay. yeah, yeah, I need know, to like, check. Let's see. But you said that they both have a they all have a large deformation. They just have a no 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 it's ground state. Let's say look, you start mm -hmm. here from spherical shape. Okay. This is 126. You gradually develop some deformation. Let's say I need to check the calculations. Okay. Probably, yeah, probably, probably, probably. Let's say uh -huh. no. Oh, 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 oh. That's yeah. But then let, let's say if you go to odd nuclear, you get oblate deformation. And let's say no, it should be vice versa. Let me check. Let's say my we have one quadruple moment measure and it's negative for the for the two plus state and then even even Okay, let me check what I wrote in the paper because it was 30 pages of a huge information. <laughs> but anyway, let's say the basic idea is you play with the change of the deformation between even, even, and all mass. And this has impact on the charge rate. Now, more than this. Again, in the, in the formula of the charge radius, the beta appears as beta squared, right? 
Why, why make a difference on the chart trading? Uh, because one is, let's say, oblique minima is a bit smaller than prolate minima. It's absolute prolate difference. The, right? the, the absolute value of beta is different. Yeah, and again, in uh, DFT calculations, this plot is not completely symmetric with respect to factor. There is some asymmetry. But again, let's say if you're moving, let's say, to Malibdenium, which is not far from the region of our concern, you see the same kind of problems, let's say, with flat potential energy surfaces, let's say, which is propagating through quite large region. Now let's look on the, uh, let's say, calculated experimental uh, charge radio shown by Circles, and you see what is happening. Let's say you start here from spherical shape. Experimental situation is well des described. But then let's say you have two possibilities: either continue this spherical shape or build some excited minimum of this prolate deformation. The relative energy is not always reproduced correctly, but let's say what you see is that if you assume that this excited minima has, let's say, this deformation, and this is a DDPC one, you well reproduce experimental data. So basically, what it tells you, let's say, by this analysis of the charge radiate, you can gain some information about the deformation. But it also stresses the point that when you go from one system to another system in the region of the transition, you can miss, let's say, the description as seen, let's say, by some of these functions. So, uh, now, rotation, it's very easy. Let's say I will show only two slides. Basically what we do, and that was done in okay, 22, 22 years ago, let's say we take this relativistic hardy framework, we add Coriolis interaction, uh, that creates space-like components of the vector mesons which uh, contribute to the currents and which are affecting time of mean fields, let's say. And uh, those are quite important in rotating nuclei because they give 20 to 30 percent uh, contribution to the moment of finishing. Now let's see how this framework is working. Those are calculations which we done systematically for actinides. And what is shown here, dots, which are red ones, let's say, are experimental data results of calculations are shown by the solid lines and the data which was obtained after our calculations is shown here by pink numbers, by pink dots, sorry, not pink, cyan. Cyan dots, let's say, and you see that, look, my model has a lot of predictive power because those are predictions, basically. Uh, it explains alignment in some nuclei but in some nuclei, it predicts too early alignment, which is too classified for alignment. So I, 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 well, what is the plot here? Moment to finish. So moment, you're basically looking at the high spin states? No. Or look, I basically look. Uh, oil changes. Energy. Describe what's it I would say. This is rigid rotor. Let's say you can take a difference between uh, and let's say you eliminate this dependence. Okay. Yeah, omega is related to the difference of the energies I and I minus one. That's correct. Experimentally. Yeah, experimentally, yeah. Okay. You, you, this is basically what we've taken the, yeah. for definition of the moment of finishing. So you take energy difference, and I don't remember which factor you divide, let's say two or four, let's say, I need to check, let's say. Mm -hmm. But this is related to the difference. What is the x-axis? Rotational frequency, yeah. it's basically, roughly speaking, energy of time transition divided by p. So, so it's a between zero and a two plus. Okay, so you have yes. to stay so I, I plus two, yeah, right. you have e gamma, oops. Uh, e gamma, let's say, then if you want, let's say, to get omega, it's approximately e gamma divided by two, or maybe four. It's not this is very easy to define. But, uh, okay, but uh, the moment of inertia is also defined by the energy difference. Yeah, but let's say the formula is different. 
So assuming rigid rotor, this assumption rigid rotor. <clears throat> but then the, this curve means you have many, many states. So yeah, this means, let's say, yeah, for yeah, example, yeah. here, yeah. we are going to spin around 30 h bar. Oh, so, so we go very high in speed. Let's say. So your moment you nurse a sudden change. Uh, at, uh, and sudden change is because, let's say, you make, let's say, basically, you start to occupy two plus five states. So called bending. Let's say, well, bending, bending. So you go from vacuum configuration to two plus five configuration. Which increase the moment in inertia. Yeah, uh, drastically uh, because let's say, look, you kill pairing correlations. Oh. Remember, let's say that this was shown easy in VTEC, let's say this is an experimental tool. You have two limits, let's say, for the moon motor One is hydrodynamic and another is rigid rotation. Right, right. Experimental data in between. Yeah. If you kill pairing correlations, let's say, uh, your moment of finisher is coming closer to the rigid for the moment of finish. Not exactly, but schematic. Closer to rigid. Yeah. Oh. But look, if you look, let's say what, what is most important, low spin part, we are getting the same accuracy of the description of the deformation and the moments of finish. So we get consistent picture in this mass region. Now let's look at the next topic. This is survey. So, so that means if it's not consistent, we should follow a straight line or there's some kind of uh, fixed um, line. Look, basically, yeah, if, if the let's say, moment of finish would be not change, you will get a straight line. Mm -hmm. But the reason why it is increasing is because let's say there is so-called Coriolis anti-pairing effect. Let's say. When you start to rotate the system, pairing is decreasing, this leads to increased moment of tension. Maybe in some cases, the rotation is interpreted as two bands crossing each other. No, no, this is let's say what is happening let's say, in back bending region. Yeah, completely. Let's say. This is, Ground state and S band, let's say, okay. like Stevens, let's say, in the 70s. In the okay. But basically, what it tells you, let's say, that we are doing quite a good job in terms of moments of finish and deformations in this mass region. Now, let's look on the optical deformation. We have already showed this kind of picture, let's say, and uh, basically, uh, this was collaboration between uh, Vitek and me, let's say, and our groups, let's say, and in, let's say basically we did calculations for four covariant energy density functions, global calculations. We searched for optical deformation of the whole nuclear chart. And then we did the same with skirm uh, energy density functions, five, let's say so. And basically this uh, reflects the situation, let's say what is shown here. This green line is a boundaries of the regions of non nuclear. Uh, and this is model multiplicity or number of models predicting non-zero optical deformation with nucleus with Zn. Let's say the higher the number, the more reliable are predictions. The lower the number, okay, then there is a lot of what's the problems in the definition of optical deformation. And as you can see, we are more or less consistent in two models here. This bridge is created mostly by the uh, skewn calculations. And again, let's say we have something in both models here, let's say. Look, you can go to super heavy nuclear or very neutron rich actinides, but this is definitely a bit of experimental reach. And uh, let's say the region where we are interested here, we basically 96 isomers, isomers, let's say, we don't have so much indication for the body. Okay, but the what's the criteria you use as the as a, a being a, a optical deform? What's the you have put some stretch on the paper value? No, no, we basically use the I will show you let's say quantity. We basically use this quantity, which is you do two type of calculations, one without optical deformation, another with optical deformation. And this Difference in binding energy tells you how much you gain in binding due to the optical deformation. The larger this quantity is, the more reliable is prediction for static optical deformation. If this is 10 kV, I really don't care. It's not static optical deformation. It's, if that is 2 MeV, it's very good candidate for static optical deformation. But basically, what I'm trying to tell is that, okay, there are some consistencies between two models. And, uh, but there is also some interesting drifts, which again related to underlying differences in the single particle structure, which Vitek did not mention, let's say, 
So if you look, let's say, where the biggest overlap between relativistic and spion models is, this is shown by this uh, black diamonds. Now, region where spion is preferring, let's say, uh, octopole nuclei, octopole deformed nuclei is blue and relativistic is red. And as you can see, there is always some kind of shift, let's say, of the region of the octopole deformation in relativistic series by two or four neutron numbers in all mass regions. So there is some kind of systematic difference between those models. If you look carefully on experimental data, then it's very difficult to say which model you need to prefer. So because look, there are very few nuclei which can be really described as a static optical deform. And in transitional nuclei, you need to do the optimal field calculations. Now, if you, but this is not end of the story. Okay, this is current density function, we'll say more or less included. This is already included. But let's look on two calculations. This is Borne calculations, and this is Micmac calculations by Peter Miller. And again, you see, look, there's a lot of, let's say, uncertainty in the location of the uh, predicted regions of octopole deformation. In the cases when we have, let's say, octopole deformation measured in experiment, this is very few nuclei. Let's say, look, we predict more than the experimentalists can measure, even in optimates. Let's say. So, uh, they is how to say, be uncertainty in the definition of this octopole deformation region. Now, you can ask, let's say, which factors are affecting, let's say, the predictions. What is shown here is the following let's say, you select uh, isotope chain, which is thoriums, is proton number 90. Then you do some calculations. And this is beta two and beta three, and this is gain in the binding energy due to octopole deformation. So the bigger number, the better it is, let's say. And you see, for example, if you take the DME delta, it does not predict deformed nuclear octopole deformed nuclear whatsoever. Let's say. And the reason is very simple because it has two large 92 spherical functions and normal calculations. But all other functions are more or less consistent, but the transition point from, uh, let's say, non-octopole deformed to octopole deformed is model dependent. So again, it's related to differences in underlying single particle structure. Now, another factor which people, let's say, were not aware is that, let's say, look, you have also some uncertainties in the pairing strengths. And remember, I already mentioned in the beginning that pairing uh, favors spherical shape. And this is a very nice illustration how it can happen Let's say you take a single nucleus, 224 thorium. You see it has well developed, let's say, uh, octopole deformed minimum, let's say. And now what you do, you simply change the pairing strength, let's say, and what is happening is the following. This pairing strength is shown here. The stronger the pairing is, at some point, you go to spherical nucleus. Let's say, so this factor has to be taken in account, let's say, when you want to make very precise calculations. Now let's go. So, with, can I, uh, yeah. so if you go back to the model, the, the, the summary of model, so uh, you only uh, require some energy above a certain threshold to be. Uh, everything is large, let's say, for this quantity. What, what is the, what's the criteria? Let's say e everything is larger than zero. It's considered. Yeah, it's considered as a, at least octopole soft. And, and it's shown as one yeah. of the circles. Yeah. Okay. So there is no threshold. So okay. okay. See, it's simply positive value for this. In, if you want, let's say, to understand better the case, let's say, look, you need to look yeah. more systematically, let's say, and look on the potential energy surfaces. But we simply wanted, let's say, simple measure where it can happen. Now, so I don't understand how your method differs from just doing a totally unconstrained calculation and see whether it has an optical deformation or not. Look, basically, we do constraint calculations also. You see, this is constraint calculations. Look, you can, a tricky part is the following, let's say, and we played with that. Let's say, look, uh, you define initial deformation of the basis. If the initial deformation of the basis contains octopole degree, let's say, instead of doing constraint calculations, let's say you can do unconstrained yeah. calculations, and they will con converge to this minimum. Right, right. And, and that's after all the right? So look, 
you cannot do, let's say, this scan, let's say, in this kind of situation to all nuclei. Let's say we, we simply guided by the initial deformation of the basis, which already gives you some push. I, okay, yeah. I got it. Yeah. <clears throat> now, let's look on the situation in the Samarium isotopes, which were discussed as a one interesting chain for the investigation. And again, here I, let's say, provide a summary, let's say, which we gave in this publication. Uh, Again, we are looking upon this measure of the softness or deepness of the potential energy surface, let's say. And uh, let's say our calculations for samarium isotopes gives only one nucleus, uh, let's say 150 samarium, in which we have some kind of octuple deformation driving energy, which is not zero, let's say around 250 kV or 90 kV. So this nucleus can be described better, let's say, as uh, Octopus soft. It's not the study deformation in reality. That's it. If uh, this is publication by a Chinese group from Beijing, they do this PK1 functional, they found some octopus deformation, let's say, in this chain of isotopes, let's say, and in 150 samarium, this is very large gain in the uh, opt opt sorry, binding energy due to octopus deformation. However, if you look on experimental data, and this is what I'm usually doing in the case, let's say, where there is challenge, let's say, there is no any support for octopole uh, deformation picture, let's say, in uh, this nucleus. But now, it is really very soft, the IBJ thing could be very exactly. small, it's hard to really predict. No, but you, look, look this, the problem is the following, let's say, and this is all the models which are on the market. You see, sometimes they are showing, let's say, very soft, let's say, like 20 kV, what do you make in that? Octopus soft, let's say. Uh, here, again, let's say this is Bognia, 200 kV, 43 kV, octopus soft, let's say. But if you look on the experiment to take, all those nuclei in the Samarium neodymium uh, region, which are the subject, let's say, of the studies of octopus deformation, are basically vibrators, octopus vibrators. And in the case of octopus vibrator, let's say, look, you have some measure of like B3. But this B3 is measured between three minor state and ground state. Does it tell you full story about the deformation of ground state? Right. Let's say I'm not completely sure because look, what you measure is different shape. Different. Uh, let's say and look. Uh, so the, what are you using as an experimental criterion? Uh, there's no, no, no in reality. Let's say if you look on the if you look on the literature. Let's say, uh, look, I was involved in the software called the form business in the 80s, let's say, when it became one of the big topics, let's say. And uh, at that time, people were studying all those, let's say, analytical type models, etc. Let's say, Vita has a nice review together with Peter Butler. And the consequence and, and consensus is in such a way that, okay, if you have a B3, you can probably, let's say, attribute some optical deformation through the relation to B3. On the, only in the rigid water limit. So you need to have a rotational bend. Then you can think about static optical deformation, assuming that the deformation between two states don't change with the angular momentum. If you have octopole vibration, the picture is different. Look, you have a ground state, which is okay, you have some kind of zero point motion, etc. Not that much. But the vibrational state is okay, it's vibrating. I'm still not getting what kind of experimental information. There is nothing. Uh, there is a problem. Look, I, I really, let's say, you said that you were looking at experimental data and you don't see evidence for of static optical deformation in the, uh, in the, the rare earths. And I'm just wondering what kind of data you use. Look, basically, let's say, look, when this business became the same for 90s, uh, sorry, 80s, 90s plus century. Uh, look, we were looking for set of experimental data. For example, one of the fingerprints is alternating parity bands, okay. rotational structure. Second, let's say you look on the old marked nuclear, let's say, if you have two states of opposite parity with the same projection of angular momentum and axis of symmetry, and if they have similar properties, this is probably due to optical deformation. But again, let's say if you look on this kind of setup, you look, let's say, on case of static optical deformation, mostly in 
few nuclei around of 226 radium, 224 thorium, 224 radium, both nuclei which clearly show the structure. When you go, for example, to rhenium, less neutral number, let's say, as compared with 90, you are again in a situation of octopole vibration. And in case of octopole vibration, the three-jet rotor model approximation for the beta-3 does not work. It's not just a fact, let's say. So, so the criterion you're using, you're just comparing the, basically, moments of inertia in this quadruple and, well, the, the, the positive parity and negative parity. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, like this, this is, yeah, this is one of the possibilities because they behave in a different way in the case of static deformation, static octopole deformation and octopole vibration. Say. This is one of the possibilities. Let's say, but look, there are few more ingredients which are put into the game, like the coupling parameters for K0100 states, what must nuclear. Like, let's say, the hindrance factors for alpha decay. And look, I have a set, let's say, you, you can check, let's say, the review article by me. Yeah, I, I know this yeah. review article. I was just interested what data you referred to saying that no, there's no, look, no evidence here. What kind of. Look, basically, data here what we are like? looking for simple quantity. We are looking for this gain in the binding energy due to octopole deformation. But gain simply tells you that, okay, potential energy surface can be soft, but it doesn't necessarily mean, let's say, that it's optical deformed system. Let's say. And if you look on the set of all experimental observers, like moments are finished, let's say, like you mentioned, they behave like optical vibrators in some other region. And uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so there's a clear indication with the the ground state rotational band would have both even and odd members. I mean, that, that would mean that the intrinsic shape was uh, violated parity. And there's no nucleus that has that feature in the ground state band. So. In the radium region, let's see, radiums and thoriums, some of them are showing. I will show you this. this oh, OK. So, yeah. uh, but, but in neodymium, some ion region, none of them are showing this kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So, so you'll show a real example. Yeah, basically, look, there is another let's say, situation which is very similar to what we are facing here. It's super heavy nuclear. Sorry. Yeah. You said that uh, um, P3 cannot give you a ground state of uh, octopole deformation, but uh, how do you believe uh, PE2 can give you a. Uh, look, again, let's say E2 gives you, let's say, in the case of only rotational structures. Let's say, because look, there is people frequently forget about basic approximations between those relations between deformation and octopole moment, or between beta 2 and quadruple moment. Let's say. This is valid in the case of rigid water rotation or rigid rotation. And this is realizing in many cases, like in those optimized situations, say, there you can make this connection. You can do that in the uh, Yes, region, but you cannot do this in transition only way. But uh, you also have a formula for beta 3 roughly equal to Q30. Yeah, but this is valid for uh, this is way how we extract octopole deformation from, from the optical one. And this is not necessarily what experiment is it's matched. Okay. This is theoretical measure. Look, some people even prefer to plot Q20 or Q30 instead of. Uh, let's say, deformations. And in reality, this is a better way. The de deficiency is the following. Then you cannot compare nuclei from different parts of the nuclear chart because they will be different in Q2 by factors so of 2, 3, 4. And you want something, let's say, which is comparable. I mean, this gives deformation. <coughs> so this is, in general, uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, this B3 cannot give you a, a uh, optical deformation for the nuclei. This is uh, for all the species of uh, BC can give you some optical deformation in the case of static optical. Like a uh, run like, like, uh, 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 224. Yeah, like uranium, sorry, like this uh, radium 224 to 26 or thorium 224. That's it. Where we clearly see that it behaves like rigid rotations. Uh, okay. Let's say, but if you have a transitional situation, then it will not work. It, it is misleading. 
Now let's look on this challenge of super heavy because it can, let's say, it holds some kind of similarities to what we are facing in this mass region. And look, this story exists from 1970, 50 years, and there is no solution here. <laughs> and basically, look, it's summarized in this kind of situation. Look, this is calculations with two functions, DDPC1, PCPK1. Again, this is deformation, green means prolate. Let's say this uh, orange or reddish means oblate, and gray means spherical shape. Now, this is two very good functions, PCPK1, PDPC1, but they have slight differences in underlying single particle structure. Now, if you look, no nuclei are shown by open circles. Look, in this region of actinides and light super heavy, everything is nice and agrees with models. Now you go, let's say here, here in this function, you basically don't have a spherical nuclei. You have a sharp transition from the uh, prolate to oblate shapes. Here it's behaving more classically. So you have a prolate shapes, oblate, spherical, and then oblate. So now let's look on those high LZ systems which are measured, let's say, with 118, 116, let's say. In this functional, they will be oblate, but in this functional, they will be spherical. Can we tell a difference in experimental level? No, because we need to plus that, and which is not measured. So now, how we can, you can say in this situation, you can say, okay, let's go beyond mean field, let's see what is happening. And this is only part of the problem, which is invariant density functional theory. If you look on non relativistic models, they predict 184 neutron shell closure and 126 proton shell closure. MIG mark model gives 184, uh, 116, let's say. So there is a mess. And available experimental data, like you see here, it does not allow to discriminate between the model predictions. Now, this is, let's say, what we did together with a group uh, in the University of Beijing. Let's say we started from mean field. Let's say this is potential energy surfaces. Let's say this is a fusion saddle. Let's say those are minima, which are spherical for those nuclei with proton number 120 and functional. This is probably DDPC one, yeah. Now you use five dimensional character Hamiltonian approach to, call, to include correlations beyond the field. And you see for this system with 172 neutrons, your minimum is still here. Let's say in energy. Here, minimum, let's say, is drifting to oblate shape. Uh, this is spherical, and this is again oblate shape. Let's say. Now you see collective wave function for the ground state, and there is a mismatch of the position of the minimum collective wave function and the minimum energy. Let's say, but basically, what we can say, at least for proton number 120, you can modify the outcome of the calculations by including the correlations beyond the field. What is the three rows? This is mean field. Mm -hmm. This is uh, mean field plus zero point energies, which are coming from five dimensional collective Hamiltonian. So this is how to say approximation of what Benjamin is doing. Mm -hmm. Simple model. Uh, and this is, let's say, collective wave function to the ground state. Oh, I see. So this is some, like, some shifts. Yeah, yeah, okay. Some shifts, let's say. Now you can summarize, let's say, you can look along this neutron number 174, proton number 120, or neutron number 184, let's say. And in some cases, like for example, in this case, uh, you start, mean field is given by dashed lines. Now, if you include beyond mean field, let's say you get a convergence of different solutions in both cases, let's say. For both functions, let's say. But this is not the case here. So you see, let's say, sometimes beyond mean field solution gives you different outcome, but this is not necessarily the case because it depends on many ingredients. Now, uh, so for example, inclusion of dynamical correlations brings the prediction of DDPC. Oh, so how many, so many slices? Okay, I, I, let me skip this so the, one. The, the next half is shorter. Yeah, okay. How much time I have? I need three slides. Yeah. Okay, basically, look, this is one of the examples. Let's say where uh, you cannot resolve the problems by simply going to the field. Now, 
96 zirconium, and this is my personal takeoff of the situation. Look, there was interesting calculations by uh, Ron and Lou, let's say, I'm not sure whether it published or not, let's say, but it created a lot of, let's say, enhancement in this EME meeting, let's say, in May at least, let's say. And the broad point is the following, let's say, you create octopal deformation, uh, let's say, this large optical value, let's say, factor three, zero, uh, around 0 0.25. Let's say, if I would be, let's say, experiment with, I would say, okay, you have new minima, it's collective enough, you need to build a rotational pattern. So now this is example of 226 radio, one of the best cases, let's say. Okay, unfortunately it's from not best publication, but you see, this is interleaving E1 transitions, the energies of which are shown, let's say. This is positive parity branch, this is negative parity branch, and this is very strong argument for static optical deformation. But again, let's say it should not be taken alone, it should be complemented by analysis of rotational motion, and the properties of the boring or the old annual rate. Let's say, but what we see in this nucleus is this kind of structure, which show model like. Let's say, so there is no rotational structure, nothing, let's say, which would be indicated. This is from 2019. Let's say, Magda probably has, let's say, better scale. <laughs> the same. Uh, so basically what I'm trying to say... I'm exciting things from below, so I'm not building extended laboratories. Oh, but basically what I'm trying to see is that, okay, theory can be one result. Careful cross-check with respect of experimental data can neglect this kind of interpretation. And uh, basically uh, this is conclusion, and probably only 10 minutes late, let's say. Theoretical results are subject of theoretical uncertainties, especially in the case of transition from one shape to another shape, this change of proton and neutron numbers, and in the case of optical deformation. You saw that there is a lot of um, predictions. And again, if you look carefully, they are traced back to the single particle spectrum, to the differences in the single particle degrees of freedom. So thus the model predictions have to be confronted with experimental data, However, the situation is complicated by the fact that there is no clear experimental measure of dynamical <coughs> octopole di deformation admixture to the ground state. I really, look, what you can measure, you can measure BE3, but it will it give you information about ground state completely? Sure. No. So, and uh, look, probably you can gain some knowledge if you look on old neighbors of this 96 zirconium. I did not look on that myself, but you know, I doubt that there is real, let's say, experiment or fingerprints, let's say, or anything which reminds about the deformation. But, uh, uh, you know, when you have a very heavy system, it's easier to go it. That means you can, you have a better chance to see this, uh, all the, all the states because it takes a little bit of energy. You will see the, you know, the, the, the higher states, three minus states, right? Because it's easier for the, but the acronym is a lighter system. Moment in earth is probably smaller. I mean, I look at the three minus state is huge energy, right? You need a 1.7 MeV to get that. Look, this is so, not a mm -hmm. this is not a problem. It's because look, I was working in this calcium 40. In calcium 40, let's say this is even like the system. You go to spin 8, 16 plus. You have a nice super contribution You go to the uh Cretan region, let's say. But that's super deformed. Our deformation it is 2.2, that's not so big. Then. Krypton 46, yeah. Krypton 42, Krypton 42, uh, 44, sorry, 72, 74, 76. Mm -hmm. We have, let's say, a lot of experimental data extending up to spin around this 20 h bar. And we have a one to one correspondence between theory calculations and uh, no, no, so from my point yeah. of view, let's say, okay, maybe people did not try to populate this, let's say, in reactions which gives you high steam, but look at No, no, this. but I was talking about the octopus. Yes. Yes. Octopus, only the heavy system, you have these many, many levels because they have a large moment inertia, so I guess it's easier to excite them. But if I look at the acronym, the first three minus is 1.8 MeV. If you want to look the next one, maybe you have to go to... Uh, it's, it's going to not going to exist, right? No, but features. look, my take on this situation yeah. is a fine. Because look, I believe that at least, let's say, look, 
to see rotation of bandwidth, say you need to see two plus state. And two plus state in this case would be definitely below this energy score. Yeah, yeah, but, but we know that the United States have a small bit of you from the experimental data, right? So basically it tells you that there is no clear fingerprint of, let's say even dynamical optical definition. So my, my take on the situation is that you have, look, you excite this is vibrational state, which is why you back here. So, uh, look, you have overlap with ground state for the wave function, it's also this YC0 Let's say it gives you big, let's say, value, but this is vibration system. This is not rotation system. So you you don't get uh, how to say anything that means that you are getting some kind of stabilization. Look, and uh, okay, yeah, can I ask something? Yeah. So we are saying that there is no contribution of octopole deformation in the ground state, but we can. Uh, we can sort of imagine that there are two scenarios. One that this minimum is very flat in uh, in Q, well, in, in, in beta three, and we mm -hmm. have a, 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 a wave function that extends as this long tails, or we have a very well defined wave function that sits in this uh, beta two equal uh, beta three equal zero. So both situations would correspond to uh, well state that has an average beta three zero, but mm -hmm. then if they would be different, yes? And for them, this would be a different effect if we have this long tail. So no, no, that I agree with. And this could correspond to this situations that you call vibrational, where we uh, don't see a static deformation, where the minimum corresponds to beta three zero, but the fluctuations of this wave function extend so far from beta 3 equal 0 that they start to affect their observables. This, no, 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 is that, this that, that is a possibility. Scenario. But look, what I try to, uh, to say, we are basically speaking about uh, in some different things, let's say, because let's say you have a spin zero ground state. You can ask, let's say, the question is which state you can mix it? It's only zero plus state. <laughs> Three minus will not give you direct admission. So because let's say this, this is not how the value is. Why it has to mix? It course it, it it depends on the shape of the of the minimum of the potential. Yes. So if it's a rather flat thing, it will just extend without mixing with anything. Mm -hmm. Or just a little. No, no, no. Basically, those guys exploited this opportunity. Let's say what I'm trying to say is the following. Let's say, Look, now you can ask, let's say, where, let's say, your state will be located. Your state will be located at this definition. So if, if this mixing is taken into account, so no problem with that. It's, this is, however, let's say, if you have this large octopole deformation, what will be experimental consequences of this kind of large octopole deformation? And if I'm looking on the depth of the potential, it's very localized. Let's say. So I would guess, let's say, that then, in this case of simulation, you need to build something like, let's say, octopole rotational band like this. I fully understand, yes, and I fully agree with you. It's just, my point is that you said that other calculations apart from this sort of say that there is no static octopole deformation apart from the actinides. No, no, but look. And then you say that there is no contribution of beta three to the properties of the ground state, if this is not the case. and. And I'm just, just asking if this situation of a rather flat minimum in beta three and extended wave function wouldn't be a possibility of what we see, for example, for this zirconium. My, my take on this situation is a form. So look, you have a, uh, let's go back, let's say, to this, what you showed, let's say, for this plutonium, let's say, where you have, let's say, this oblate and provide minimum. You have uh, two rotational structures, which you can use. Yeah, so magnesium. It's, okay. Uh, maybe someone else. Yeah, somebody else. Let's say, but basically, if you go go to kryptonium, you know, overweight minima and overweight mm -hmm. minima in uh, mean field calculations. Then, when you do beyond mean field calculations, you have two options. Let's say. You still retain those two minima, or you create the <coughs> axial minima. What will be experimental consequences of this situation? In first case, if you retain those minima, but with some admixture between oblate and oblate wave functions, 
you will have a two rotational structures built on top of those minima. However, if you merge this minima and you create minima gamma equal 30, for example, there will be only one rotational structure. Let's say this is, let's say, the difference. And, uh, basically, the same kind of situation is uh, happening here. Your rotational structures should not be built, let's say, on the mean field solution. It may be built, let's say, on the beyond mean field mm -hmm. solution, let's say. And as a consequence, what is troubling me, let's say, in this case, let's say, look, and this is based on what I was working with experimentalists a lot, let's say. Yes, but my, my question did not correspond to this plot at all. It was corresponding to a potential map plot that would have minimal to zero. So, so I think Tamar will discuss this next week, right? Mm. He, he, he's, now, maybe it's a very interesting question that you're asking. What you're asking basically is whether there are uh, situations where you can have optical soft uh, configuration, which is sampled event by event in, in a heavy ion condition, but doesn't manifest in any recognizable way in these nuclear structure conditions. And if you could make that point, that would be an argument for in favor of carrying on these ideas. Uh, look, basically, look, I'm basing my <coughs> judgment here on my previous experience. I think the point is that maybe the, <coughs> the, the low energy and the high energy, they have, they have an access a little bit different information or they have sensitivity is somewhat different, right? Because we, we don't care about the excitation at all. Uh, we just... No, 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 but yeah. look, I'm looking here on excitations, like a fingerprint of the yeah. ground state. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. 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 You see, but we don't have a clear experimental, uh, well, uh, observable that could tell us how wave function is fluctuating or expanding. Yeah. As you say, if we have a static deformation in the ground state, we expect a rotational band built on that. But we don't have a clear measure of. No, no, then I completely agree. Yes. Look, and and look this, at my and last this, statement. And this is my, my question, actually, if for this community, is it not important how this wave function extends and if this tail of wave function somehow corresponds to their observables in their results? No, look, we can reformulate the question in the, in the following way. For example, can, which kind of information about ground state? You obtain by measurement of ground state itself. In most of the cases, fairly limited. So you either build excitations, let's say, or you build uh, collective rotation to probe, let's say, in better way, let's say, what kind of system we are dealing with. Let's say. And look, in their case, the challenge is the following. Because of their time scale, let's say, you don't go to excitations, you deal with only ground state. Let's say. And look, if they would measure 220, for radium, that would be the best case. <laughs> this is a set of case, let's say, for the nuclear extraction community. That's but the, this is difficult. That's the benchmark. <laughs> that's the yeah. Yeah. But look, here, let's say, if you go to those eyes of us, let's say, I have questions, let's say. Look, I'm I'm not against, let's say, the interpretation. I'm simply trying to understand what is really going on, let's say. And from standpoint of view of nuclear structure, theory and my experience, let's say, I really don't see, let's say, how it works, let's say, yeah. that creating, let's say, something, let's say, which will give you large beta 3 in this state, let's say, because look, there is no anything. Theory, look, like I showed, let's say, they can predict everything, let's say, within the reasonable ranges, let's say. The question is that we need to have a, some measure to verify those things. So let's do the following. This, we must continue this afternoon on this point on this point and we should uh, take a break now.